All right, first things first, what is a weed? Okay, a plant growing out of place, a plant growing where it's not welcome, or if you want the textbook version of it, and this is actually from a uh, weeds textbook uh, taught in horticulture programs, any plant that is competitive, persistent, or pernicious uh, interferes with human activities and as a result are undesirable. Uh, pretty much anything that you don't want growing where it is growing is a weed by any definition you want to give it. Okay, those who say job well done never needs redoing has clearly never weeded a garden. Uh, this is something uh, that uh, you will be doing with any landscape you will be doing on a pretty regular basis uh, or it gets out of hand and the more often you do it the lighter the job becomes on a regular basis. So just kind of uh, just kind of understand it's something that uh, it's a management thing and it's something you will have to keep up on uh, in order to make it lesser as you go forward. All right, what is that weed and what do I spray? Now this is the question I get pretty consistently out here in the garden. Um, if this is the question that you've uh, come to have answered, you're probably going to walk away just a little on the disappointment side uh, because that's probably not really what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a lot of ways to control weeds. Uh, very few of them actually have anything to do with uh, spraying anything on it, uh, but we'll talk about how to keep them out, get, keep them from establishing and so on. Uh, but uh, if you're really just hoping to say, this is what you spray on these weeds, it's, it's probably not gonna go that way. All right, so I think a better approach, what is that weed? Why is it there? And how do I prevent it from growing there in the future? Uh, here's the thing, nature uh, abhors a vacuum. Uh, it's, a, it's a trite saying, it's been around for a long time, but uh, it really is true. There can't be nothing in a spot. Uh, if there is, something's going to take that spot over, and usually that is going to be the most aggressive, uh, persistent plants out there, and those are usually our weeds. Uh, so here's the thing. The seeds come from everywhere. Uh, the seeds are everywhere. Uh, they're in most soils everywhere along the valley. Every landscape has weed seeds. Uh, they come from the same plant families as, the, as uh, your desired plants. So your favorite plants usually have some sort of weed attached to it as well. So if you're, your favorite asters, there are plenty of weedy asters, for instance. Uh, so anything that we use to control an, uh, a weedy aster, for instance, is going to also kill your favorite aster. So uh, part of the problem with weeds, of course, is they're, they're from the exact same families. Uh, they pop up wherever there is an opening. So wherever there's a bare patch of ground, wherever there's a lack of mulch, wherever there is Anything that's not currently occupying that area, weeds tend to pop right up. Uh, and they have a lot of different ways to defeat your control method. So no matter what we throw at them, weeds are weeds because they are really hard to control. So uh, I think the take home message for this slide for everybody is that weeds are really hard to control and you kind of have permission to be frustrated with them. Okay. One of the most important things we need to talk about uh, when it comes to weeds is that plant's life cycle. Uh, it's actually the single most important thing to consider when you're trying to tackle weeds. So it really does change how you approach uh, the weed and, and, uh, and how to defeat it down. You have to consider whether or not uh, it's an annual, uh, a perennial, or a biennial, because these all have slightly different ways that you would, uh, you would approach a control method on it. All right, so we're going to go over some annuals. Annuals are a one-year life cycle, and that means the plant germinates, it grows, it goes to seed, it flowers, goes to seed, and then the plant dies, all within one single growing year. Uh, this is broke down into two different annual types. One is called a summer annual, and this germinates in the spring. Uh, the plant is active all summer long, blooms and seeds in the summer and into the fall, and that's when it spreads its seeds. The other one is the winter annuals, and this germinates in the fall, uh, and then overwinters as a small rosette, and then becomes active as soon as it warms up in the spring. So these are the uh, annuals you see popping up early, early, early in the spring, late February, early March. Okay, so those are your winter annuals. Okay, so question is, what are the annuals thinking? All right, their whole job, their whole reason for living, their whole purpose for being is producing seed, uh, finding ways to disperse that seed, uh, these plants don't waste a lot of energy uh, on developing a root system. They don't push a lot of energy into their roots. Uh, if they get stressed at all or they feel like the weather is not great, the only thing they're going to do is just try to bloom and, and produce as much seed as possible because that's its way of survival. That's the, that's the plant's only reason for existence, is producing flowers which produce the seeds uh, so the next generation can, can continue. Okay, Biennial is a two-year life cycle. Now, biennials will form a rosette, uh, like the bull thistle on, the, uh, on your screen there, 
And then the second year, they will grow the flower that produces the seeds. Okay, so this is a two-year life cycle. Uh, biennials are kind of tricky because if the situation is right, a biennial will act like an annual and will bloom in the same year that it, uh, it started growing. Or if the uh, situation and the weather is right and it, and it feels like it's got enough energy, it'll actually overwinter for a third year and act a little like a uh, short-lived perennial. So uh, biennials usually look like the, that uh, bolt thistle right there. Uh, it's a small rosette of a plant and that's all it is in its first year. It's next year is when uh, the flower and thing really kind of explodes. Uh, so really you want to get those when they're in that rosette form before they, they go to seed. Okay, so what are biennials thinking? Okay, develop that rosette. Uh, they do need a winter time to uh, trigger the flowering. So they do kind of need to overwinter. That's why they, uh, uh, they come up in the fall. They need to overwinter. Uh, but that overwintering and then the following season's warm up is what produces uh, the trigger for the flower. So first year, develop the, the rosette, get as much energy as you can, overwinter to trigger the flowering, produce seeds, and then usually dies after a second seed. So in a way, they're a little like, uh, in, in a way, they're a little like annuals, and their whole purpose of being is to uh, put as much uh, energy as possible into flower production and its seed production. And then it will die usually shortly thereafter. Okay, perennial. Uh, perennials are plants that live for three years at least or more. Uh, some perennials are much, much longer lived than that and some are really short lived. Okay, we have these broken down into a couple different categories as well. Uh, one is a simple perennial and this is a plant with a single root system. So think of dandelion. You pull a dandelion out of the ground and that, uh, that root on the bottom of dandelion looks an awful lot like a carrot, okay? and that, that big tap root. So this is kind of a simple perennial. Uh, the creeping perennials, and these are your real bad actors in the, uh, in the weed world, are things like hoary grass, which is white top, uh, quack grass or morning glory, bind, uh, which is called field bindweed. Uh, these are your creeping perennials. These are the ones that are, that are a little more aggressive. They've got a much more extensive root system and are much, much harder to kill. Okay, so what are perennials thinking? Perennials thinking produce seed if you have the energy, but they don't have to. Uh, they're going to put a lot of energy into that root system because they're expecting to live three or four or five years, uh, possibly longer. Uh, their dispersal methods for seeds are usually much different uh, than that of a biennial or an annual uh, because they're trying to disperse them much further away. Uh, think of dandelion with its uh, little, little uh, a parachute that, that carries the seeds quite a ways from it. Okay, but their job really is to develop an extensive root system. They need to have that root system to, to live for, for quite a few years. And they tend to develop brittleness. Uh, brittle, brittleness is a, an interesting uh, concept when it comes to perennials. Uh, it, it basically uh, uh, allows them to break off if, they're, if somebody's tugging on them. So their roots uh, can exist in the ground. The roots where they've sub put all that energy into it can continue to exist in the ground. That way they can try to uh, de just develop a new plant. Uh, if they break off, okay? All right, so as humans, as uh, landscape managers or in our own yards, what should we be thinking about annuals and biennials? This one's pretty simple. Don't let them go to seed. Uh, whatever, the, whatever the weed is that you've got, don't let it flower and don't let it develop a seed head. Uh, if you do that, you're, you're uh, instilling the, uh, the, seed, the seed bed for the uh, next generation to come. Okay, so whatever you do, don't let them go to seed. Uh, if that means mowing them, if that means pulling them, just make sure you get those seed heads off because that's really where the future generations are coming from. Perennial weeds, on the other hand, are much more complicated to deal with. Now, we're gonna go over all of these terms uh, as we go through this, this, uh, this presentation, uh, but we're gonna explain the difference between source and seed, uh, which is an important concept when dealing with a perennial plant weed. Uh, knowing the difference between selective and non-selective herbicides. We'll talk a little about herbicides uh, towards the end. Um, understanding the general idea of ethical dominance is actually kind of a, an important concept in dealing with perennial weed, uh, especially if you're really trying to get rid of it. And just understanding you have to dig deeper uh, and digging them out is really the best way because um, they can develop a real brittleness to them, uh, which means if uh, they, they get tugged on at all, the chances are all you're going to get is a handful of, uh, handful of uh, leaves like this. Okay, this is a dandelion. I think we've all done this. Reached down, grabbed hold of the dandelion, and pulled on it. It came out about half an inch. Uh, there's probably four or five inches of root left at the bottom of that, uh, for which that plant will just develop uh, the, next, the next plant from, and uh, it will just keep on going, and you, you've only just barely slowed it down. So brittleness is a, is a big deal when it comes to these perennial plants. All right, so we're gonna go through a few different examples of weeds. 
And the first one, these are annual weeds. This is crabgrass. Um, crabgrass, native to the United States, a uh, single large plant produces something like 150,000 seeds, a lot. Seeds can survive in the soil up to 15 years. And I don't mean to depress anybody, but uh, that's a long time for those seeds to sit in that soil and just kind of wait for the right conditions to pop up. Uh, again, this is why weeds are so hard to fight. Uh, this is a summer annual, and the seeds germinate at about 55 degrees. That's kind of important because that helps uh, you fight it, especially when it comes to a uh, pre-emergent application. Okay, the goal on this plant is to prevent it from going to seed or keep the seeds from germinating. Uh, this is really, this is the most common one I, uh, that, that people ask uh, me about, is they'll bring in every single grass that they don't like in their yard that doesn't look like it, and they'll say, what do I do about crabgrass? Most of the time what they bring in is not crabgrass. Uh, crabgrass uh, only blooms, uh, only starts coming up in the summertime. Uh, if it's, if the, the plant is coming up early spring, not crabgrass. Okay, so this is actually a pretty good indicator for uh, pre-emergent application when it comes to dealing with crabgrass is when the forsythia start blooming. Okay, because the forsythia start blooming at about the right temperature that if you laid down the, the, the pre-emergent then, uh, you'd get most of the crabgrass on that application. Okay, puncture vine. This is also an annual, but this is a, a, a summer annual. Uh, native to the Mediterranean. Uh, this, there have been uh, notes of large plants producing as many as a million seeds. Uh, we've all dealt with this one. We've all walked through this and then walked around with the, all these, uh, uh, these uh, goat's heads stuck in our shoes, look like, or, you know, sounds like walking around in cleats. But these, uh, this, this, this plant is really insidious at times. This, is, this germinates all season long, uh, so you can be getting seeds pretty much from the second this plant starts to, uh, to pop up. Now, the good news on this one is the seeds only survive in the soil for about four years, which means if you can get a good uh, control on this for four or five years, uh, you have a pretty good chance of taking care of the problem, uh, at least on, on, a, on a large scale. Uh, the, uh, the, cool name, the cool thing about this plant is the name is Tribulus terrestris. Uh, tribulus meaning tribulation and terrestrius meaning earth. Literally, this plant's scientific name is tribulation upon the earth. So, as we all know, as uh, those of us who've dealt with this plant. Okay, this plant's a member of the Caltrop family. Uh, military military Caltrops were designed to stop the uh, horse-ridden cavalrys. Uh, they have a four-point, they have four-point configuration. That means one side is always uh, pointed out. And when I did this presentation, I, I took a look at Amazon. Turns out you can even buy these for 12 packs on Amazon. Uh, if anybody really has a, a need for that. Okay, mechanical controls for goat's head is really, really effective. Uh, sweeping them up, vacuuming them up. Uh, I've seen people use old uh, carpeting or old um, uh, foam pads or even old pumpkins and just kind of roll it through the area and all the goat heads end up stuck to those things and then they throw those things away. But these are big seeds. They really respond well to a uh, uh, just mechanical control, mechanical picking them up. Okay, annual weeds, uh, shepherd's purse. Uh, this is a winter annual, a uh, member of the mustard family. It's native to Europe, produces several thousand seeds, and viable for many years. Uh, best I can, uh, I can figure is nobody knows for sure how long they last in the soil, but uh, a good long time. So this is one of those that uh, germinates in the fall, overwinters as a small plant, and then comes up back early in the spring. So this is it in the spring uh, as it overwinters, and then uh, in the summer it pops up with a uh, bloom that looks like this and disperses its seed from there. Okay. Biennial, the first biennial, this is prickly lettuce. Uh, this is a, a Europe, but it's naturalized, it's native to Europe, it's naturalized throughout the United States. Uh, so pretty much every state in the country this has this plant growing in it. Uh, this can be, because it's a biennial, it can be a winter annual or it can be a short-lived perennial, depending on the uh, conditions. Tens of thousands of seeds per plant, and the seeds germinate almost immediately. Uh, they have a tendency to hit the soil, get a little wet, and then pop up with a plant almost as soon as they do. Uh, and the good news on this is the seeds only last up to about three years in the soil. So again, if this is a plant you can keep under control for uh, three or four years, you should be uh, good at keeping control of the plant on your, in your landscape for uh, long term. If you, just, if you can just uh, keep it down for a few years. Okay, this is what it looks like as a rosette. Remember, this is a biennial. So this is what it looks like its first year. This would be ideally the, the, uh, the form that you would take care of it in before it uh, shot up its uh, seed then. Okay. But year two produces these really pretty yellow flowers and then these little parachute seed heads uh, that are dispersed by the wind. 
common dandelion. Uh, this is Eurasia native, which uh, Eurasia is a funny word for meaning about half the, uh, half the world. Uh, simple perennial, it's got a huge fleshy taproot. Uh, so at the bottom of, a, of all dandelions is what looks like a big carrot growing on the bottom of that. Um, you have to get the vast majority of that out in order to really kill that plant. Now this spreads by seeds, uh, it can spread by shoots, and the roots can uh, extend away from it, uh, and it can spread that way too. So it's got a really a, lo a lot of good uh, uh, ways of, uh, of spreading itself. Okay? And this is the main way. So there's the flower and there's the seed head. The parachutes are actually really interesting because the parachutes come in different sizes, uh, the seeds come in different sizes. So big parachute, small seed head drifts a lot further away. Uh, small parachute, big seed head drifts closer. And uh, as the wind disperses that, there's almost an even distribution uh, away from that flower head um, of common dandelion. Uh, this is actually uh, an herb in a lot of places. It is uh, beneficial, uh, but here it is, it is definitely uh, among what we consider weeds. Okay, uh, this is a, a greetings card uh, I saw at the store. Uh, this would not be a happy card uh, for someone to give to me. Uh, two times that uh, spraying uh, uh, dandelions actually is really effective. Okay, one is when the lilac blooms. Okay, this is early in the spring, about the time the lilac's blooming, uh, spraying it with something like uh, 2,4-D or, or, or Roundup, either way, um, can be really effective uh, early in the spring, but it's probably even better uh, in the fall. And the indication on that is when you see in the mountains, when you see the uh, quakies turn gold. Uh, that is actually a better time to do it. And we'll talk a little bit about source of sink in, in a little bit and how pesticide moves through a, uh, uh, through a plant uh, a little later in this uh, presentation. Everybody recognizes the state flower of Utah. Uh, this is field bindweed. Uh, field bindweed, of course, is not the state flower of Utah, but it might as well be. It is the, uh, one of the most ubiquitous flowers in the entire state. Uh, we all have it. We all have this in our yard. We all have these weed seeds. Uh, convolvulus is, a, is the same, is the same uh, family as, as uh, morning glory, so what people often call this morning glory. Uh, this is a creeping perennial. These are some of the hardest weeds you can possibly deal with. Creeping panic perennials are really, really difficult to deal with. Uh, they tend to go down and form a layer about 10 feet down of roots uh, that if you don't kill the whole thing, the, the roots just send up a, a new plant. And then below that, another five or 10 feet, uh, they form another layer uh, that does the same thing. So these things are incredibly difficult to deal with. Uh, native to, uh, to Europe, Asia, North Africa, reproduced by seeds, but also uh, spreads by roots as well, and the roots can go many, many uh, hundreds of feet in all directions. Uh, the seeds can last in the soil for about 50 years, possibly more. 50 years is just as long as they've measured it. So I don't mean to depress you when it comes to uh, field bindweed, but it's a really, really difficult weed to control. Uh, and those seeds are sitting in the soil. They might pop up and they've been there for 50 years. So uh, very, very difficult to control this plant. Okay, this is what its root system looks like. Very extensive, very aggressive, uh, and if you don't get the entire weed, uh, the entire root structure on this uh, weed, it will come back. Which means this plant is pretty much always going to be coming back. Uh, incredibly hard weed to deal with. So uh, forgive yourself if you uh, if you're having trouble with this one. Okay, this is what field bindweed seeds look like. Quack grass is our is our second. Uh, uh, a creeping perennial, this is, it does exactly the same thing. The roots uh, behave in exactly the same way. Uh, this is a plant that people will often bring to me, bring to me and ask uh, what to do about uh, um, crabgrass. And this is not crabgrass. This is infinitely uh, harder to deal with than crabgrass. Uh, it is a creeping per perennial. It does re reproduce by seeds and by roots and by rhizomes. Uh, but the seeds only last two to four years. It's just not how it reproduces uh, most extensively. Uh, this really is a, a, an incredibly difficult plant to deal with. And this actually takes the, uh, the problem of the field bindweed to another step. Field bindweed, uh, you can at least try to apply something like round, uh, not Roundup, but uh, 2,4-D, which is uh, Weed Be Gone, because Weed Be Gone doesn't, of course, kill the grass, but it does kill the, uh, uh, the broadleaf uh, morning glory. Uh, but this is a grass, and if it's growing anywhere near your grass, uh, you'll have to kill everything in order to try to get it under control. Okay. This is how kind of how you tell quack grass from crabgrass is the seeds look more like that. And if you kind of bunch up the, uh, the seed, uh, the leaf area where, where it uh, uh, forms this little uh, thing down here, uh, you get this three points up there. 
like I said, this is often confused with crabgrass, but then again, I found that any grass that isn't regular Kentucky bluegrass gets confused with crabgrass. So this is what the, uh, the, the root system on the plant grass looks like. So you can see how this is, once this gets established, this is really hard to get under control. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, how to control weeds and the method that we use uh, most often, uh, particularly here at the garden and the one that I, I know is taught most of the time in the, in the uh, university, is called IPM. Uh, that stands for Integrated Pest Management. Uh, this is a style of weed management that includes, it's all inclusive, basically everything's on the table. So you're looking to prevent things, you're looking to do different cultural practices, uh, mechanical pulling of weeds, uh, biological uh, at times, or chemical time. So uh, we will, you know, I, I've got a, a distinct order that I'll, that I'll kind of use things out here. Um, I'll try to prevent them from coming in first and then we'll mechanically be pulling them out uh, with uh, some sort of uh, a chemical spray being the absolute last uh, option for us. Okay. Weed prevention, preventing the arrival. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to prevent the arrival. Uh, you want to work on preventing uh, them getting established. And then you want to prevent them from spreading if they do get established. Okay, one of the best ways to spread weed seeds or even other uh, pathogen pathogens is to not clean equipment. Uh, if you've hired a lawn service and they come to your house from wherever they were before, uh, did they spray off their equipment? Is it is it covered with the weed seeds that were all uh, collected at the last place they were at? Um, if not, you kind of want to make sure that this is the case. You, kind of, you do want to clean off equipment before you uh, transfer site to site, or you could be just moving weeds site to site. Uh, weed seeds can come in through topsoil. Uh, someone buys some topsoil and brings out to their brings out to their land. Uh, this is often has weed seeds in it. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a picture right here uh, out near Farmington. This is out near Lagoon. Uh, that pile uh, that you see there with all the weeds growing on it is a topsoil pile. Um, I watched uh, several uh, tractors go ahead and pull out. Uh, truck, loads of that load trucks as they were going to uh, to their site. So all those weed seeds are, are definitely making their way up to the house uh, if you're buying some topsoil. And so uh, careful of the topsoil you buy as well. Uh, it can make its way into compost, uh, especially if you're composting uh, various weeds. Uh, a temperature of about 140 degrees uh, kills most weed seeds. So if you're you're at home, uh, go ahead and buy one of these these thermometers, uh, compost thermometers. They're pretty inexpensive. And any large scale commercial you know, operation making compost, like the uh, like landfills or, or anybody who does this large scale, uh, will know exactly how uh, what the temperature they're getting their uh, compost pile up to. Okay, uh, you want to prep prevent establishment. Uh, so. Mulching is really important to preventing establishment. That keeps uh, weed seeds sitting on top of the layer of mulch instead of actually getting contact with the soil. Uh, use drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is particularly effective at helping to avoid weeds uh, because it sits on the soil surface below a layer of mulch and waters from there. So it's not uh, spraying out over the top of everything and watering all the weed seeds that has landed on the top of the surface of the mulch or uh, of the soil. So use of drip irrigation is really a good way to uh, prevent weeds from, from getting uh, established in your yard. Um, avoid soil compaction. So if you've got an area that you're walking over constantly or driving over even in, in uh, through a landscape area, that compacted soil usually becomes harder to establish a good uh, plant in that area and weeds are, will usually move in pretty quick to take that spot, okay? Also avoid soil disruption. So if you've got, uh, if you've got uh, an area where uh, something uh, uh, scraped the soil or, or created a divot, uh, that disruption now uh, allows the seeds that are maybe growing underneath there uh, to come up to the surface and uh, give seeds a chance there to get contact with the soil. Uh, so avoid uh, compaction or disruption. And then as a last resort, uh, herbicides. And we'll talk about herbicides, but again, we're gonna talk about it at the very end because that's kind of where it falls in the order of operation here. Okay, mulch. Mulch is one of the best things you can do uh, in your landscape, in your garden beds. Uh, to keep the weeds from getting really, to get in, get in, getting established. But again, you're gonna wanna use a source of, of mulch that, uh, that uh, gets that temperature up if it's compost or is weed free when you uh, buy it. Drip irrigation looks like this. Uh, this is a, an area out here in the garden. Uh, this drip irrigation is, is flexible and sits under that, under that compost layer. 
uh, that, that allows the weed seeds to really just sit on sit on top of the surface and not find purchase with the uh, the soil, so it can uh, get established. Compaction. Uh, this looks like a, a lawn or someone's been driving over it. Uh, this is a you see that the lawn has a, a lot of time a hard time establishing in those compacted ruts, uh, but the weeds will find it much easier. Disruption. Uh, again, uh, tilling is one of, is, is a major disruption, obviously. Um, if I could advise not tilling on most situations, I would. Uh, even uh, even vegetable gardens every year. Tilling brings up seeds from the uh, bottom that were not bothering anybody and brings them up to where now they can get some uh, sunlight and some water going. And uh, uh, now they can germinate and start, start going. Um, I found it just much, much easier to not actually till every year unless you've got compaction and then there are ways to uh, to alleviate, alleviate compaction through aeration or broad fork or something like that but uh, tilling uh, is something I would advise uh, not to do you know by and large all right the promise of weed barrier fabric uh, weed barrier fabric uh, creates a barrier on the ground prevents weeds in the ground from germinating because uh, they can't come up through that fabric and uh, uh, you cut some little holes in it and then plant them there Okay, it's great stuff, right? No, it's really not. Uh, it, it doesn't actually work very well at all. Weed barrier fabric, in my uh, experience, causes compaction, uh, which we're trying to avoid. You see this picture of a tree where we took the weed fabric away from it. You can see how close to the surface that root had to develop because of the compaction. Uh, prevents organic matter from going into the soil. It encourages water runoff at the surface because of that soil compaction. Uh, and it doesn't actually prevent weed seeds from germinating on top uh, of that uh, of that fabric, and then uh, what they'll do is the roots will kind of inter intertwine with that fabric, and that actually causes a, a, a much harder time to get those weeds out. And okay? and so it's it really is weed fabric is I've been pulling it out here in the garden for the last little while, and I can show it in there are areas where the garden where it's been there for ten years or better, and the soil underneath is really just that's how I can describe it as dead. There's no organic matter. There's no worms. There's no microorganisms living underneath there. It can't live underneath that uh, weed barrier fabric. Water moves through it okay, air moves through it, but that compaction that it causes and the fact that you can get no organic matter and thus none of the, uh, uh, just the composites that develop in the soil that the organic matter provides is a big deal. And you'd be better off with just a good thick layer of mulch than using weed barrier fabric. So here is the local scapes recipe for weed prevention. And we've talked about most of those already. Mulch, three inches of mulch works wonders in any landscape. Uh, don't use weed fabric. Uh, I would say one of the other problems I see with weed fabric, of course, is uh, people cut a hole and they plant something in it. Say they plant a tree. Five years later, that tree's out growing that hole and nobody's really made that hole any bigger. And uh, I've actually seen it kill trees. So uh, avoid compaction and disruption of the soil. Uh, this is a definite invitation for weeds to come on in. Uh, drip system sitting uh, on the ground uh, with the mulch sitting on top of there is a really good, is just really my best advice for weed prevention. And then spot treat with herbicides as a last resort if you have to. Weed prevention in lawns, lawns a little different. Uh, mow higher, so three inches of uh, lawn will crowd out weeds. Uh, water correctly, uh, weeds need the water too, so don't, you don't want to overwater. When I say water correctly, I really mean do water appropriately. Um, Overwatering will absolutely uh, cause more weeds to uh, form because what water that the grass isn't using will be used by the weeds. Um, use an edger along hard ads like uh, sidewalks. Uh, too often I see somebody go out there with a string trimmer and, and uh, cut it really low along that uh, hard edge. And it creates this kind of bevel before the lawn gets tall. Uh, and this really is an invitation to weeds in your lawn, especially right there where the uh, where the uh, lawn is now uncompetitive and short. Uh, better to use an edger along that edge and keep, the, keep it tall. Uh, fertilize based on need. Uh, over fertilizing uh, leads to excessive weeds. This is one of the biggest things I've seen in lawns when it comes to uh, weed uh, getting a, a good uh, foothold in the lawn is over fertilizing, especially fertilizing in the middle of summer. Uh, fertilizing in the middle of summer, uh, grass really is trying to kind of go dormant in the middle of summer. It's not really using a lot of fertilizer, so all of that fertilizer that you do uh, as it gets much above 80 degrees is actually just being used by the weeds. Okay, so definitely no fertilizing uh, at that time of year, and, and really like just, just generally over fertilizing, it just causes weeds. 
Uh, so use a weed tool before using your herbicide. Uh, pull them before they go to seed. Uh, weed tools are, mechanical weed tools are really some of the best uh, weed, uh, weed uh, uh, prevention that you've got, or at least uh, uh, dealing with weeds that do make their way into your landscape. Okay, this is, this is the weed knife I've got. This is my most common tool for using against weeds. It's just a, a simple life, a simple design. Allows me to get a hold of the plant, get up underneath the, the roots far enough and pluck it all up. Uh, but this is what me and the, and the crew use. 90 plus percent of all weed issues can be dealt with, which is that tool. So herbicides. Okay, if we must use herbicides, if uh, you decide that uh, uh, you've had enough of a, a particular area, uh, there are some uh, some things I want to kind of go over. Um, so kind of, this is kind of just nomenclature, really. Pre-emergent, okay, kills weeds before they break the surface. Uh, a post-emergent kills already existing weeds. Um, a contact herbicide kills only parts of the weed that gets sprayed. So usually that's just the top of the weed, not uh, down to the roots. Uh, systemic, though, gets actually into the plant and is translocated throughout the weed. Uh, in theory, it will kill the entire plant, including the roots. Okay, pre-emergent herbicides work something like this. So the pre-emergents you're going to find most uh, on the market are going to be like preen, which is a, a, a trifluralin. Dimension, which is, uh, I can't pronounce that one, uh, dithiopur. Uh, but those are the type, uh, those are the two most common ones I see in the market. So what this does is you, you spread this out and then you water it in. And this creates an herbicide barrier across the, the surface of the, uh, the soil. And what happens when a seed germinates, uh, the first leaf comes out, hits that uh, pre-emergent barrier and absorbs the herbicide and then dies. So that's how that works. Now this only works on newly germinating seeds. It doesn't work on established plants, so this won't kill grass, this won't kill your favorite peonies, this won't kill anything you've got already growing in your landscape. Uh, but it does need the right timing, because uh, once the seeds germinate, it's really too late for this method to, uh, to work. And any disturbance in the soil will actually break the, uh, break the barrier and uh, thus allow the seeds to come up in that spot. Uh, so mainly I've seen this used for things like uh, crabgrass or the annual annual varieties of, uh, of weeds. Uh, and once you, once you put it down on the ground, you only have a few days to really get that thing watered in uh, in order to create it or else uh, you lose a lot of that to, to the atmosphere. Uh, again, read the label. In fact, with any pesticide, definitely read the label before you, uh, before you use it, okay? Uh, if you somebody put a pre-emergent down here, of course, that uh, those people running around sliding would have uh, created a big hole in that herbicide and it wouldn't work anymore. Systemic herbicides, uh, so there's two types of systemics. One is selective and only affects the uh, selected type of plant. So uh, weed be gone or grass be gone. Weed be gone affects broadleaves, but not grasses. Grass be gone actually affects grasses, but not broadleaves. Uh, Non-selective kills all plants. So this is, uh, this is glyphosate or Roundup or things like kills all uh, that will kill pretty much anything that it uh, comes into contact with. And selective versus non-selective. So you can see right here, you've got a, a lawn area that somebody has clearly went out with a non-selective herbicide and sprayed what looks like dandelions. Uh, you can see in the other picture right there, it looks like a, a, a small uh, dandelion growing in there, but the dandelion actually looks like it might survive this experience. Uh, things like Roundup is actually far more active on grass than it is on broadleaves. Uh, and so it's more, much more likely to actually kill the grass than it is a, a broadleaf weed. What somebody wanted to use there was something like 2,4-D, uh, we'd be gone. Something would just kill the broadleaves and not uh, the grass. So you see some uh, uh, broadleaf weeds growing up in the lawn here. Uh, what you'd want to spray again is something that doesn't kill the grass but does kill the broadleaves. Now, this is an example of uh, control for the grass in the garden bed. So it looks like what happened here is uh, they've got uh, grass that moved into the garden beds, and they use the product that kills the grass, but not the broadleaves. So the one on the one side, the, the white flowers, definitely uh, used it, and the grass died, and, and they looked okay, but the other side uh, did not, and the grass is still kind of running around. And that's what it looks like from the other side. Okay, so co controlling grass and garden beds, there, uh, 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 this is, there's one called uh, clethodyne. 
uh, fluazofop, which is graspigon, uh, or fusilod, or cefoxodin, which is called post or segment, and a few others. Uh, these are actually pretty effective at killing grass uh, in a broadleaf garden bed. Uh, they do work very slowly, though. This isn't like uh, spring roundup on something and watching it die in a week or so. Uh, these take weeks or a month or better to, uh, to work, uh, and they smell really, really terrible. All right, source to sink. Uh, we talked, uh, mentioned earlier that I would mention this to you. When dealing with uh, particularly perennial weeds, this is actually kind of an important concept to, uh, uh, to kind of understand. So in the spring, uh, the, uh, all the energy uh, brought up from the, 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 uh, that the leaves are producing, are mostly grow, growing up to the leaves. Okay, the plant is trying to grow some leaves, it's trying to get photosynthesis going, uh, it might start growing flowers, but everything's kind of moving up in the plant. In the fall, things are moving down in the plant. The perennial plant wants to store energy in its roots, in its crown for the, uh, for the winter time, uh, so that it's got enough energy the following season to uh, grow again. So this is, this is actually an important uh, idea for if we're going to be uh, throwing a herbicide onto a perennial plant. Uh, so doing it in the spring, you're not likely to get as good a control on things because uh, what happens is pesticide follows the, uh, the sugars in a plant and it would be going mostly up to the leaves. But spraying a, spraying a uh, perennial plant like dandelion or even bindweed or crackgrass like that in the fall, uh, it's pulling all of that down into the roots and circulating it much, uh, much more down deeply into the roots. And that's got a much better chance of killing that plant completely. Okay, apical dominance is kind of the other one that I want to uh, discuss. Um, what it is is the main the, the main bud on a plant uh, puts out a chemical that uh, inhibits all buds behind it. The further you get from that, the less control you have. Okay, this is why a lot of things take on kind of a pyramid shape or like a typical Christmas tree shape. Uh, it's because the control is just less on the bottom than it is on the top. Now, the way that works in a perennial weed is if you remove that bud or use like with a lawnmower or with a tiller, uh, then there's no longer uh, that bud controlling all of those uh, auxiliary buds and they're going to just sprout, all right? So if you were to run a tiller, for instance, through a field of bindweed, you would end up just creating about a million bindweed plants okay, because you've, uh, you've uh, pulled the tips off and you've created this uh, situation where uh, they're all, all the auxiliary buds are actually going crazy trying to compete and now they're all growing so okay so when dealing with a perennial dealing particularly with perennial weeds uh don't just mow them down uh you're likely just you're, you're likely to uh, create actually more of a problem on that one okay so this is an example of uh, quack grass uh, they, this can this plant as well as uh, things like morning glory bindweed can form a plant as little as about an inch of its root system uh, once you take that, uh, once you take that main bud off, so uh, it's really becomes completely out of control if uh, you try to use tillers on these. Okay, so before you spray, and this is super important, this might be the most important thing you need to know if you're going to break out an herbicide uh, on a weed, is read that label. Okay, you need to understand what that weed will, that what that what that label is telling you. Uh, know the weed you're targeting because you need to know what weed this is. Uh, proper identification of the weed. Uh, it's important because you need to look at that label and find out if what you're killing is actually on the label. Uh, otherwise, you're just spraying uh, what, uh, uh, what I've heard called, uh, you're just spraying recreation crop. So, uh, and then you need to know if spraying that weed is just better than hand weeding, because sometimes just hand weeding is really the, the way to go. Okay, okay, so read the label. Okay, this is a, a standard label. It will have everything you need to know about that plant. It'll have the scientific name, it'll have what, uh, protection you need to use for yourself. It'll have how long you need to wait uh, once you spray an area to re-enter. Uh, it'll tell you what plants that uh, that pesticide is meant to kill. Um, if you are trying to kill clover and clover is not on the label, it probably doesn't kill clover. So you might want a different product. So really you want to read through this, uh, this label. Uh, and this label above all else is a legal document. This is actually a contract. Uh, by using a uh, uh, pesticide like this, you're actually agreeing to everything in the label as if it were a contract. So definitely read through that label. Know the weed you're targeting. Uh, there are classes, there are internet, there are you know, various ways that you can uh, help, uh, that, that can help you uh, use the USU Extension Service, for, for instance. 
It can help you identify a weed, but knowing what the weed is you're attacking really is, really is important uh, because a lot of times uh, what affects one plant isn't going to affect that other weed. So um, you want to know uh, about the plant's life cycle. We talked about that earlier. Uh, various controls work better uh, with, with other uh, with plants in the other uh, life cycle than it does in some others. So you kind of want to know what its life cycle is and knowing that obviously you have to identify the weed. Uh, but you also want to know where the weed is growing because that label will tell you um, it's this this is good for agriculture but not a homeowner or it's not good near a river or there are different areas that might tell you that uh, weed can't be used at. So again you want to go through that uh, that labeling because that's really important. So you do want to know the weed, you do want to know its life cycle, and you kind of want to know what location it's growing in before you uh, attempt to spray uh, any kind of plant. Uh, the other thing you're going to want to do before you spray is consider another method first. Um, can you just go out there with a weed knife and get it up, or do you need to invite a bunch of friends over with shovels to really take it up that way? Because uh, if these will work, they might be your better options uh, before breaking out uh, pesticide. Okay, so. You're going to use herbicides. Uh, annual weeds like crabgrass, you can use a pre-emergent, but it has to be uh, down on the right time of year and then watered in properly. Um, again, that's where that, uh, when the first of the year blooming comes in. Uh, biennials like prickly lettuce, for instance, you want to use a pre-emergent for the seeds, but once the plant starts to come up, you'll want to use a systemic on that rosette. Now, something that will get in there and, and kill that plant. For the simple perennials, uh, systemic herbicide around the first bloom, uh, but is more effectively in the fall. Uh, so this is where uh, the dandelion uh, around the uh, forsythia bloom is uh, is useful, but also in the fall is also useful. Okay, and those are the those are the two best things you're going to be most effective. And the creeping perennials, uh, systemic herbicide right after the first bloom, but again more effective in the fall. So if you're tackling field bindweed, morning glory, um, as soon as you get terrific flowers on it. Uh, this is when the source to sink kind of changes in the plant. Uh, that's when you want to get the, uh, the systemic herbicide on that plant so it can start uh, uh, going back down to the roots. Or in the fall, most perennial plants are sending all the energy down into the roots. Uh, and so in the fall, things are much more effective that way. Pre-emergence, like uh, trifluralin uh, tri is preen. Uh, dimension, barricade, uh, there's a few other, few other things. Uh, again, timing's got to be right, and most of those have to be watered in within a few days of uh, application. So selective systemics, right? So we've talked about what a selective is and what a systemic is, uh, but this is kind of combines them. So this is this is selective; it only kills certain things, uh, but it is a systemic, gets into the system, uh, and it works its way through the plant. So 2,4-D is like weed being on. Uh, this also also a whole bunch of others have 2,4-D uh, in it. But this is selective broadleaf herbicide, don't use it when it's hot outside. Uh, Tupordine works best uh, on, on uh, broadleaf stuff, doesn't kill your grass, but it is systemic. It does a breakdown and get into the plant and tries to kill it for the root. But once it hits over 85 or 90 degrees, uh, Tupordine has a tendency to volatilize and then floats around your yard as a mist, uh, basically killing whatever plants it touches. Uh, dicamba is a selective broadleaf herbicide, again, just for broadleafs. Uh, it has some residual left in the soil. If you've ever seen a, uh, a pesticide called three-way or four-way or something like that, usually it's 2,4-D and dicamba, dicamba and a few other of these others. And the dicamba is, dicamba is meant to leave a little residual in the soil uh, for a little longer control. Uh, Fluazifop is grass Now uh, This will kill grass, but not broadly. So this is, uh, this is killing uh, just grass that has gotten into a uh, a perennial garden, uh, but keep in mind again, it, it, it smells horrible and it takes, uh, takes a bit of time to, to work, but it does work. Uh, Cloprolid, uh, this is selective broadleaf herbicide. Uh, the combination of this would be stinger, uh, but this is this one is known to persist a little bit in compost. Uh, that 140 degrees might not get the herbicide out, so I've actually seen people use uh, cloprolid uh, on a, on a weed, the weed ends up in the uh, compost bin, and the compost ends up uh, carrying the herbicide back out into the garden. Uh, so be careful with that one, especially if you're going to be composting your plants. Uh, these are systemics, uh, but they are non selective. They will kill pretty much anything they touch. So glyphosate is the name. You know it as Roundup or Kills All or Spectricide. Uh, many others use the name uh, of Roundup. But this is non selective, it's a, it's a 
it's a systemic, you will get into the plant and kill it. Uh, glyphosate generally has low volatility, which means you can use it in a little bit hotter temperatures, uh, and it binds to soil. So one of the problems you get with uh, Roundup is if you spray dirty plants, it, it tends to bind to that soil and not to get into the plant. Uh, Tricloquil uh, is, a, is a product called Alligare. Uh, this is non-selective herbicide if it kills plants, grasses, and, and it can even uh, kill trees. Uh, there are organic methods uh, that circulate um, out there. Uh, vinegar at five and a half to 20 percent uh, does destroy most of the above, above ground growth. Uh, but this is not unlike pulling a weed without, on, without pulling the roots out. It tends to kill just the top foliage. Uh, I've seen these, uh, these flame, these flame, uh, uh, flame dragons and things like that, little blow torches. Uh, they do kill the leaf growth, kill, kill leaf growth, and small plants uh, uh, probably won't come back. But if it's an established plant, it, it won't build a root and it'll, it'll probably just make its way back up. Uh, the other problem I have, I think, with the flame is, is be careful you don't clear a section and just leave it open and, uh, uh, for the next uh, weeds to, to settle in. Um, I've seen salt water uh, used or Epsom salt used. Uh, enough of this kind of stuff in the root zone can kill weeds, but it also might remain in the soil later to kill desirable plants later. Uh, there is a, a common uh, a thread I see um, it, as an organic method involves, you know, vinegar and, and Epsom salt and uh, uh, some dishwashing soap. Um, I, I would advise some caution with that, just as I would advise caution with any other herbicide. Uh, all you've done is just you, you put together a chemical herbicide. It's not as organic, I think, as it seems, and it has the potential to uh, kill microorganism, microorganism growth with vinegar or, or with that salt. So I'd be, I'd be as careful with uh, that, some of those organic methods as I would. Uh, in some of the herbicides. Uh, and the last bit is neighborhood cooperation. Uh, if you really want a good weed uh, control uh, program to work, getting your neighbors on board is a really good way. Uh, I took this uh, picture out in West Jordan uh, last summer uh, with all the uh, kochia uh, tumbleweeds that are piled up against it. So uh, getting, uh, getting everybody in your neighborhood on board with, with uh, weed prevention is actually a really good way uh, because if your neighbor's uh, house has tons of weeds, you can do what you you can do what you can, but it, it's always going to be a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a battle. So, all right, I'll turn it back over to Candice now. Uh, I think she might have a few questions uh, to throw at us. Um, okay, I think we're good. I think that's it for questions. Thank you guys cool. for joining us, and thank you so much for that presentation. That was great. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, you bet. Um, I'm